It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight and Guillaume Serena. Uh, he joins us this evening to discuss the Reykjavik summit in 1986, which for those of you who didn't maybe live through it, if you Google it and read about it in this wonderful book, uh, you'll understand why it has become such a, uh, a crucible and a, and a historical landmark for what might have been, and I would add what might still could be. Um, Today's leaders, we feel, or I'm interested to hear, uh, I feel, could learn from this, from this uh, missed opportunity. I'm going to be um, discussing the, the book and questions that I have with it, as, as Julia said, and then at the end of the conversation, we're gonna open up to the audience for, for questions. Um, Guillaume, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the World Affairs Council for inviting me. Well, it's our pleasure. Now, let's begin by discussing, I think, the question on everyone's mind, which is, what got you interested in this topic? Why write a book on the Reykjavik summit, which is not only hard to pronounce, it's harder to spell? And how to write at every line. Um, well, um, you know, I was born in the 70s, and I remembered it as a kid on TV. I remember Reagan and Gorbachev shaking hands in front of that uh, strange White House in Reykjavik. Um, and uh, I studied history, uh, and especially U.S. history and international relations. And I've always been fascinated in the Cold War, especially the last, uh, the last part of it. So um, one day I was uh, talking with a friend of mine, another journalist, and we were talking about the leaders from that era, uh, Reagan and then Bush and Thatcher and Mitterrand and uh, Helmut Kohl. And you know, these are people with huge personalities, whether you agree with them on a policy matter. And I was comparing them to the leaders, and that was five or six years ago when I, uh, and it seemed like the leaders uh, were so different and the world has changed so much. So I just started to research a little bit um, what happened between Reagan and Gorbachev, more than what I knew. And, uh, and I discovered the Reykjavik uh, summit, which is a quite a, particular episode and a particular missed opportunity, as we will see. And so you, you mentioned the personalities of, of world leaders, which, as we all know today, can be extremely important in understanding or maybe confounding. Um, but a lot of the book also mentions and, and describes sort of the, the politics at home and surprisingly, not just in the United States, which is, after all, democracy in an open society, but in the Soviet Union. You, you talk about Gorbachev and the, and the powers that be, but also his desire and, and need, frankly, to develop the economy in the Soviet Union. And for Reagan, it was, it was politics. It was an upcoming midterm election cycle. It was uh, the, the promise he had brought to the American people and basically re protecting his flank. So I, I wonder if you might say a little bit more about, aside from these big personalities, the importance, the role, um, the opportunity that, that public power and, and uh, political power, political with a small p, might play in these types of affairs. Yes, of course. Uh, two big personalities, and I do think they were able to get along on a human level, also because they both grew up in the countryside, in agriculture background. So these two guys were somehow very rooted, uh, literally. And I think that kind of explains how they got along. But beyond that, you do have two uh, opposite political systems, institutional systems, with a lot of defiance toward each other. And you can see that in the conversations, you can see that in the book. They're constantly reproaching to each other, basically Reagan implying you're a dictator, and uh, uh, Gorbachev saying in return, well, you can't lead, you have a Congress, and you have the press, and you can't make decisions, it's complicated. I, I really summarize and, and uh, speak globally, but so there was defiance because there was no trust because of the systems. Uh, but, and then in addition, as you said, you had the whole background of current affairs in both countries. Uh, the midterm elections are three weeks after the Reykjavik uh, meeting. And Gorbachev has to deal with uh, the aftermath of Chernobyl uh, and of uh, Perestroika and Glasnost, which he started just one year before starting to have some effects 
Um, also, um, unlike what we all uh, suppose, uh, the Soviet Union was not necessarily a one man deciding everything. He had to deal with inside forces. He had to deal with the Politburo, with the Soviet Supreme, with the Red Army and the KGB, pretty powerful. But what Gorbachev achieved to do really quickly, he arrived in power in March 85, uh, but really quickly, in one year, he kind of had the whole support of the whole machine. And when you look at the papers uh, of the Politburo, uh, the archives, uh, right before the Reykjavik meeting, he has a blank check from the Politburo to discuss whatever he wants at Reykjavik with Reagan, which I think is quite unique. I'm not a, a Sovietologue or Sovietologist specialist, but it's, pretty, it's quite unique in the history of that uh, system that there was this unity around him. And you, ca you could feel that during the two days in Reykjavik, actually the Americans ended up being more divided by the, than the Soviets. So a lot of this information is fairly new. You did a lot of archival research in our own archives, and you just mentioned the Politburo and the, um, the documents. I'm curious, I, s I spent some time myself looking at our own US classification system, and it is <clears throat> Byzantine to say the least. What, was it Putin that decided, okay, we can take the lid off some of this stuff? Was, was there a law and a, a certain number of years passed? How was it you were able to access this? I'm not sure about Putin, but actually uh, under Boris Yeltsin, so right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, they opened most of the archives. Uh, I remember having teachers uh, at the Sorbonne University, uh, people being able to speak and read Russian, who rushed to Moscow, and they were the first ones, among the first ones, historians, to look at all these archives. So uh, the sources I have in the book were actually uh, Politburo uh, and even um, Kremlin uh, archives translated into English, and these archives are actually in the United States. Uh, I had the help from the George Washington University. They have a whole uh, uh, department uh, dealing with the Soviet archives. So I was lucky enough to work with that and to work at the Reagan Presidential Library where all the White House and State Department archives are. So it was interesting to compare and it was interesting to actually see that the notes, the records of the actual conversations between the two leaders are almost 100% identical uh, from both sides. So. The note takers did really a good job. Uh, I'm not sure there were any note takers recently in <laughs> Helsinki or, or Hanoi or Saigon, I forgot where it was. Uh, but that's important. That's extremely important. We have a law in the United States where uh, the administrations are obliged to keep all the archives so historians can work. Um, so, yeah. And if you've never been to the Reagan Library down in Southern California, even if you don't go inside, it's a pretty nice place. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that Gorbachev was able to, I don't know if consolidates the right word, but actually get the backing of, of the Politburo and other, others rather quickly. What do you attribute that to? Was the Politburo itself young like he was? Was, was this the recognition that it is time to pass the torch? I'm, I'm curious. I'm not sure, but uh, he was the youngest for sure. Uh, you know, when he arrives in power, he's 55. Uh, as you remember, all the previous general secretaries all died in a one year after another, you know, starting Brezhnev in, uh, in uh, 82, Andropov, Chernyenko, and finally they find a younger guy who was the number two or number three. Uh, but he does have to deal with older people and with all these uh, uh, balances, between all these inside institutions. I think he did have that power of communicating really well. He was the first Soviet leader to go in the streets with cameras around him to talk to the Soviet people. Um, he was, I think, really a master in that. Uh, but he wasn't necessarily popular within his team. Uh, when I talked to uh, his uh, nuclear advisor, Roald Sagdaev, he was pretty cynical about Gorbachev. You know, he was saying, you know, he loved to listen to himself. Uh, 
Uh, and definitely, I mean, I had the chance to meet him a couple of years ago in Moscow, and he's definitely a straight shooter, straightforward. He looks at you in the eyes. So that was new, you know. And when the Americans first started to speak to him, and the first one was Vice President Bush, uh, uh, during the funeral of Chanyenko. So Gor it, Gorbachev was about so, so to So this become is George Herbert Walker Bush, exactly. not Bush Sr. Reagan's Bush vice Sr., president right. before he was president. Uh, he came back and Thatcher had the same impression and Francois Mitterrand as well saying, this is a guy we can work with. Like he's different. Well, I, I want to keep this theme of the personalities that matter going, but but go down a level. So obviously Reagan and, and Gorbachev, you could say, were elected or selected. But there's a whole cast of characters that are not elected. And, and this is the way the system works, right? You elect your, your Congress or your parliament or your Duma, and then they appoint people. And so you mentioned Roald Sagdiev, the, the uh, Russian or Soviet um, science advisor, who interestingly married Susan Eisenhower. Exactly. And I thought it was interesting because in the book he said, we're going to use these quotes from Eisenhower to sort of get at Reagan. Yeah. So it is interesting, the um, kind of close-knit nature of, of the personalities. But then you also have people like George Schultz. You had uh, Edward Chevernyedze on the other side. You had Robert McFarlane. You also had a guy by the name of Richard Pearl, who, at least in my small arms control community, um, is, let's, how to put this nicely, doesn't have a big fan base. Um, but the I way you why. characterize the meetings happening, um, it, it, it seemed very mission-oriented. There, there seemed to be um, a, a clear eye on what could be. And so I just wondered, is there something beneath what you say in the book about, about those characters? Was there more mischief than, than I gleaned? Or I'm curious. It's, I'm curious too, it's hard to say. You know, I could talk to some of them and obviously uh, 30 years later, they were keen and happy to talk about it without any pressure. So that was really nice. Um, you know, talk to uh, uh, Pat Buchanan, who was the head of communications, or uh, Admiral Point Dexter, who was the national security advisor, for example. And for them, it's good memories. So it was nice to have them talk about it and dig a little bit. Uh, the, the feeling I have reading the notes they were sending to each other at the time within the White House or between departments, uh, it was really professional, it was really interesting. Um, definitely they were not agreeing on many things. You, can, you could, as I'm sure it's true uh, in many administrations, seeing the weight of the defense, the military, and the diplomats not wanting the same thing. And that became the big issue in Reykjavik. Um, so, and yeah, and you have to deal with personalities indeed. And as you can see in the book, uh, Schultz uh, and Chavanetze, the two foreign affairs people, who are sitting with the presidents in the room, uh, bring something different, bring a different kind of emotion or a different kind of thinking things through. Um, and that was a collaborative effort. At the end of the day, it's two leaders choosing, but you have all this aeropage of people, sometimes with a different agenda, and it's really fascinating. Same thing on the Soviet side, obviously. You had very strong characters, yeah. Well, and you also mentioned that the, the size of the delegations was limited. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Sagdaev wasn't there, which may have had some interesting roles. I, I want to talk about him a, a moment, but actually what he's emblematic of, which, which is the role that, that scientists and technical expertise plays in these kinds of, of um, negotiations, not just the, the pageantry of summits, but the fact that, uh, you know, on the one hand, yes, we're talking about incredibly powerful weapons. It, it doesn't take a scientist to understand the devastation these, these can wreak. But when it comes to getting down to the nitty gritty of an arms control negotiation or treaty and how you're going to ensure that each side is adhering to it and technical means and verification, 
these are extremely important. So the, the, the question I have is, from your reading of the archives, from your sort of understanding of, of Reykjavik, or, or maybe Summitry at large, um, could you maybe provide your observations of, of the role, the importance of that technical expertise, not only from a government or official um, aspect, but from citizen science, um, because you mentioned the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, was ultimately, and spoiler alert, it's, it's sort of the sticking point of the whole summit. Um, there were harsh critics about whether it would work, whether even if it worked, you wanted to do it because of the underlying um, deterioration of deterrence. So I'm curious about whether you feel scientists, technical experts, how important they are, where they should and could play a role, and what the health of that is today. That's a lot, I apologize. But. I'll try. Um, yeah, obviously it's extremely important. Uh, when Reagan announces SDI in 83, Strategic Defense Initiative, that was nicknamed Star Wars by the media, which is the key point uh, in the book, um, he takes uh, the, scient the American scientific community by surprise. And the reaction of the US scientists are all over the place. And they are stand up against it almost the next day. Um, he does that speech in the White House. And you can read in the newspapers of the next few days, uh, the American scientists don't understand. And they say, not only it's dangerous, you're taking the risk to arm space, but this is not achievable. Like, in terms of cost, in terms of science, how are you going to put a laser on a satellite and maintain it in space for years? Uh, the irony of all that story is that 35 years later, it's still not possible. Uh, so you had a, a historic missed opportunity based on something that was not scientifically possible. But politics, and the policy was based on that, on something that couldn't exist, certainly not in the next 10 years. So indeed, that's where science and technique, technology advisors become extremely important. Um, I'm, don't, I'm not sure, I didn't see it in the archives, that Reagan had the whole knowledge of how it would work or even how nuclear international intercontinental missile work or the, the, you know, the implications of that. Um, what was interesting to see in the summit and in the preparation of the summit is that the Soviets came with extremely precise and specific points, category by category of nuclear weapons, of, of missiles, etc. To answer very broadly to your question, because I'm not uh, an expert myself uh, on the scientific way, um, it's extremely important. Sagdeyev that you're mentioning was in Geneva the first time they meet in 85. He was not in Reykjavik, was not an official summit. It was an intermediate summit, kind of rushed uh, and surprising in a surprising way. It was not planned. Um, uh, but he definitely had several meetings with Gorbachev beforehand and afterhand, and definitely had exchange of notes with uh, Gorbachev himself. Uh, so you're asking me about today. Uh, I'm not sure how the current American president works uh, with about these issues. I don't know who really advised him on these questions and if the technicians and scientists have access to him. I can't answer that. Fair enough. <laughs> there's still, going back to the question about the archives, there's still a fair amount of secrecy out there, although I think the good news is there's also an incredible amount of access to information that in 1986 there wouldn't have been. Um, one thing I, I want to ask, and, and it's not a, a criticism, and, and I hope I'm right in my, in my uh, assumption, a lot of the focus begins appropriately in, in sort of 84, 85, 86, when the summit was, the Geneva summit in, in the fall of 85. You talk about the context of Chernobyl, 
and then this sort of spy affair as well as making it a challenging environment. But what I did not see, and, and perhaps I missed it, is um, any reference to the American television program The Day After, which aired in 1983, right around the time of, this, of the SDI speech, or the 1982 nuclear freeze march where a million people uh, march, and this was still in, in Reagan's first term. So I'm curious because, again, from, from my experience in the, specifically in the nuclear arms control community, these are iconic. And, and in particular, the day after is credited with impacting Reagan. A come to Jesus moment for Ronald Reagan. Yeah. 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 No, you're right. I don't address it in the book. Uh, I probably should have. Uh, so thank you for pointing it. I decided to start the book with Ronald Reagan's second in inauguration, and two months later, they come to power. Three months later, to Gorbachev. So I could have linked, to, you know, to it. Uh, I didn't do it. Um, but I, you know, it, it's a book for a mainstream uh, audience, and uh, I thought the, about the storytelling, you know, and the the human. Uh, interactions between the two of them, I had to make some choices. So yeah. No, no. But thank you. That, that's very clear. And and just a, a, a small, uh, maybe a quick Yelp review. Um, I was telling Guillaume beforehand that I found this very easy to read. I, I'm not um, a huge reader, as it turns out. But this is written like a series of newspaper articles. So I think the journalist background in you comes out. So um, it's it's very quick and and very I think precise. So I appreciated that aspect of it. Um, you you made a fair amount. You, you spent a fair amount of page real estate on this um, this issue of of SDI, which was the sticking point. And it was it was painful to read where you know they were really trying to get together and land on some agreement. But the strategic defense initiative really became the sticking point because, as much as I think the engineers and scientists might have said this, this is not going to work. The Soviets were afraid of it. They felt one of two things would happen. It, it's it's going to work, and that's scary. Or even if it doesn't work, we're going to spend ourselves into oblivion trying to overcome even a marginal defense system. And so what Gorbachev was willing to offer was limited testing in the laboratory over a decade. And that word laboratory became a, a big problem. And I couldn't help but think about this in the current context with North Korea, where the US line is they're going to denuclearize. And most of my colleagues who pay attention to this stuff smack their head and say, no, they're not. You're not listening. They're talking about the whole peninsula. They're talking about a much grander scheme. So again, I guess my question is uh, your, your own broad um, learning or sort of observation about, you, you mentioned the record keeps or keepers being very um, in sync. The words, particularly when you're dealing with different languages, but the, the terminology, the definitions of words yes. and the preparation um, at Reykjavik and, and in today's world. Yeah. No, that's that's very interesting. Um, I think in a nutshell, the Americans oversold SDI to the Soviets and the Soviets overbought it. Um, really. Um, in terms of, um, okay, the context with the Chernobyl accident uh, forces Gorbachev to write that letter to Reagan that summer in July, so three months after Chernobyl, saying, I know we decided to meet in Washington or in Moscow next year, but I would really like to meet first uh, and try to discuss arm, arm race and nuclear issues. Uh, definitely the impact of Chernobyl within the Politburo and the Soviet system was huge. So I think there was that fear and that need to address it with the Americans. Um, the, you're mentioning the laboratory. Maybe we should explain a little bit what they discuss uh, in Reykjavik during these two days in October 86. Uh, on the first day, to summarize, they agree to, uh, to uh, reduce uh, intermediate missile. Okay, so that's, that's a deal. But the second day, uh, in the morning, Gorbachev basically plays his cards and say, why don't we get rid of all nuclear weapons, all categories, all of them? We don't talk about offensive, defensive, whatever. Uh, but in return, 
uh, we do that in 10 years. But in return, you have to get rid of the SDI. Uh, so the whole day, they go back and forth, and it's really dramatic and human, and they laugh, they're almost crying, they joke, there's a lot of tension. It's extremely touching, in a way, when you read that. Um, um, the whole talk become about that word, laboratory. Because Reagan keeps saying, I don't want to give it up. Uh, I don't want to give up research and development of the SDI. I promised it to the American people. Uh, I cannot go back on that. And Gorbachev says, why don't you do it in the laboratory? Because anyway, you don't have the technology right now. Uh, we know you had some breakthrough, but uh, it's not ready, and it won't be ready within 10 years. So why don't you stick it to the lab and not deploy it in space? In the meantime, we reach an agreement of elimin eliminating all nuclear weapons within 10 years with that trust and verify system where American experts would go in the Soviet Union and make sure they would indeed destroy their weapons. And the same thing here in the US. And that failure of these talks are because of that definition of laboratory. So when you bring it to the, to the former advisors, and for example, Rol Sekdeyev, he says, it could have meant anything. Laboratory is not necessarily a basement with people in white you know, coats trying to do something. You know, it could have been into space in a very safe way. It could have been elsewhere in a very safe way. Um, so it looks like there might have been even a misunderstanding there. We're not sure. Um, at least there, were way, there are ways to interpret that. Um, and at the end, the decision to Reagan to not accept the deal, uh, which was actually badly wanted by uh, Schultz on his side, um, was um, very, uh, very moving. And it was really deeply linked to that promise, probably. Yeah, and, and you wrote, I think, eloquently about Reagan's own, you know, there was a principle and a value he was negotiating with, but he, he also said things like, I can't bring that back home, or that will hurt me back home. So there, there was this internal yeah, and conflict. probably having the midterms elections in two weeks, you know. I mean, that's a, it's a democracy, you know, and with the press and with polls about his popularity. Uh, Gorbachev didn't have that. That's what he says to him. He says, you don't have to deal with that, you know. Um, so, yeah, he has to deal with that. Now, the intimate decision of not striking a deal, I think nobody will really ever know, you know. Right. His advisors say different things about it. Uh, he was right, he was wrong, you know. Um, but who exactly knows, you know. There's even that that anecdote where he was... You know, at the time, Reagan is 75. He's uh, 20 years older than Gorbachev. They've been sitting for two days in these not very comfortable chairs in that house in Reykjavik, pretty uh, spar spartiate, do you say that in English? Spartan. Yeah, really not very comfortable. And uh, in the Sunday afternoon, when this conversation becomes so incredibly intense about the possibility of getting rid of all nuclear weapons uh, arrives. Uh, the, the possibility of extending the summit to a third day comes. And Reagan says, oh shit, I quote. And Nancy is not here. Nancy stayed in Washington. And it, it was Ronald Reagan we're talking about. He didn't say, oh golly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Okay, uh, it's in the archives. No, it's not in the archives. But um, uh, but Raisa Gorbachev, Gorbachev's wife, is in Reykjavik, and who knows? Maybe it played a role. You know, maybe he didn't want to stay one more night. Maybe he was exhausted. Who knows? Again, I'm, I'm well, 75 in 1986 is not like 75 in 2019. So I th think you have to take that into account too. Um, one of the things that was interesting, um, Gorbachev had off. It, it did seem that the Soviets had put on offer several things 
right away. One of which was, we're not even going to talk about France and the UK and their nuclear arsenal, which, you know, they had it and have a nuclear arsenal, a substantial one. And so I'm curious, as, as a Frenchman, um, if that was sort of interesting to you and um, what you feel about France's continuance to have a nuclear arsenal. France has roughly 300 nuclear weapons today, about half of which are on submarines, and the other half are on what are called air-launched cruise missiles on aircraft. So one way I think about it, if you're the Soviet Union, it's sort of like when we got so upset that they had missiles in Cuba in the 60s because they were 90 miles from our, our shores, the Soviets live with that every day. So, how do you know I'm French, by the way? <laughs> um, your, uh, your dapper attire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was interesting to see that, you know, and it was interesting to see uh, the letter of the French ambassador to Washington, to the White House after the SDI speech, saying, "Don't, don't arm the space," you know, basically saying, "You guys are not the only ones there," you know, uh, we Europeans have to be taken into consideration. And let's put things in context. Europe is split in two. Uh, you have, you know, Germany is split in two. And on each side of the border, you have these Pershing II missiles and the SS-20 missiles facing each other. So Europe was held hostages, hostage sorry, uh, during that whole era. Um, so it was interesting to, you know, I remember uh, being born in the, min in the mid 70s. I remember all of that. I remember uh, the French president Mitterrand's speech in uh, the, the, uh, uh, at the German uh, parliament, basically allowing uh, the Americans to deploy Pershing too, saying, okay, I'm okay with that. Um, so it was interesting to see how the UK, France tried to have a say, um, but obviously probably failing at it. Uh, you know, I mean, it's still true today, but it was more true at the time. 90% of the arsenals are held by the Russians and the Americans. So it's true that today France has, I think, is number three in terms of numbers of nuclear weapons, um, uh, 300, as you said. Um, and yeah, and uh, more than the Chinese, even though we're not sure about the Chinese numbers exactly, I think. You know more better than me. Um, but yeah, what's interesting is that despite the end of the Cold War and being now in a world with many more powers, uh, but in a more unstable world, uh, in a less rational world. I mean, the Cold War was scary. Cuba was scary. But you were dealing with two major players we, which were still thinking in a rational way. Today, we have nine countries who have nuclear weapons. And I'm not sure all <laughs> who is really rational about it. You know, And if you take the French example, uh, we are still totally in that dogma of deterrence and of we have to keep spending billions every year to maintain that arsenal. And for me, that whole idea is totally obsolete. Maybe we'll talk about that. But um, it's still very much a Cold War uh, approach in a world that has changed so much. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I do want to get back to that in, in a moment. I think that. Um, that, that it's pivotal, it's fundamental to understanding why this negotiation was so difficult because at the core of it, which wasn't really explicit in the book so much, is this, this belief uh, in nuclear deterrence. And when you say there are nine nations now that possess nuclear weapons and is everyone still being rational, part of the answer, my, part of my answer to that would be the problem lies when using nuclear weapons is considered rational. And, and, and some nations exactly. have said, they've gotten away from pure deterrence. They've gone into, well, we would consider using them if somebody uses chemical weapons. or so. That, the, the lines have become blurred. So, but, but I want to hold there for a minute because I have another question that I actually, it's a little bit different, but I think very important for every audience. Um, there is this cast of characters, and, and you did a great job at, at naming them and who they were and providing just sort of a fluid, like a bit of their background too. You know, they weren't all farmers. You know, some were came out right out of West Point or Annapolis. Um, uh, 
But there was one name that jumped out at me, Roz Ridgway, Roseanne Ridgway, who I, I got to meet um, years ago, who was George Schultz as the Secretary of State's um, Special Assistant on European Affairs. And it jumped out at me because it was the only woman's name in the book. And again, this was the mid 80s, but um, there's, I find a very exciting energy. There are organizations and groups promoting women and uh, minority groups in nuclear security, in national security. And I think we should all applaud that and encourage that. Um, I just wanted to ask you your own experience. Did that, did, did, did that strike you? And, and in course. talking about the book, do you find your audiences more diverse than they might have been in 1986? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, I was shocked to see it was only really very old white males, uh, you know, talking, dealing with these issues in, in each administration. Uh, Rose uh, being the, on, the only one. <laughs> Uh, as you mentioned, uh, yeah. Today, uh, when I go to you know some congresses or book signings or uh, uh, there's a lot of young people and a lot of women for sure. Uh, still, it's a very much still unknown topic. As you know, people don't think about it. People don't talk about it. You know, uh, presidential candidates have, are never asked about it. Uh, What's with that? You know, we have more than 13,000 nuclear warheads today, right? It's approximately the, the number on Earth. Why don't we talk about that? You know, and the price tag that comes with it is, I think it's $16 billion per year within a defense budget here in the United States. For a smaller country like France, I think it's around 5 uh, billion euros each year. So, Let's talk about that, you know, let's, let's make sure our leaders are being asked about it. I think it's important. No, I appreciate that. I think just, just to add uh, a bit of context there, you're absolutely right. The, the, the A problem I would, I would offer with respect to nuclear weapons today is not only their continued presence, roughly, roughly 15,000, not a single treaty in the entire Cold War history, whether it was the strategic arms limitation talks, which just sort of capped weapons, the strategic arms reduction talks, none of them actually mandates that a warhead be destroyed. They're all about missiles and aircraft and how many you're allowed to have, but none of them have actually said you have to take apart the bomb. So that's one thing. The other thing is, even though the numbers have come down dramatically, we are improving accuracy, that we're building, well, when I say we, I mean the United States, but as a matter of fact, all the nuclear nations have some modernization plans. And the way I think about it is like, if you think about an ax, you know, well, it's a new handle and it's a new head, but it's still my old ax. It's like, well, actually, not so much. And the cost is astronomical. The United States is poised to spend a trillion, with a T, dollars on these modern new submarines, new missiles, new aircraft between now and 2030. France, um, about 25 billion euros uh, to build some new submarines and new um, aircraft. So it's real money. And uh, it should be talked about because the, the trade-offs are, are what's important. So. And for what? I mean, I think that's really the, the question. For something that we will never use? For something like how do we solve nowadays international crisis like Syria or Ukraine or with a nuclear weapon? No, right? So we're taking the risk, the risk to keep these weapons that can be hacked, that can explode by, ex by accident, that can be taken by uh, terrorists. So the, the risks are major. And when I talk to some people in the in in your field, uh, or even in the defense field, you know they're saying we're you know it's we're much closer to a nuclear bomb exploding now that we are from Hiroshima. Um, so again, we're spending all that money. We're even building new, more modernizing them. For what? What's what's the strategy behind it? You know uh, that whole deterrence theory is based on uh, human being flawless. Uh, my feeling is that it's a miracle <laughs> that it hasn't happened. So are we going to keep playing with fire, or are we going to seriously talk about reducing that number and go around the table? And I think the Reykjavik summit can give some kind of a frame of international discussions. I think the climate agreement of Paris, 
which was signed by every single country on earth, can also be a model of international negotiation. Obviously, there's a treaty that was uh, signed two years ago uh, to ban nuclear weapons. I think 70 countries have signed it. It's, uh, it's a long way, it's hard, but that is also a frame, you know, a method we can try but you have to have political will. Right, That's and, and one of the things you do in the book is uh, the, the, the momentum and the achievements post Reykjavik coming up to actually very recently. Um, but I, I don't think when, when you finish the book, the, 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 the acronym, because we love acronyms in this field, is TPNW, which is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It is a, an official UN document and instrument. It has been approved. It needs more states to ratify it to enter into force. But I, I think that I would offer that it is an expression of the frustration of most of the world and most of the non-nuclear nations with the utter lack of progress on what's called Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which some may argue, lawyers dispute this, obligates nuclear weapon states to disarm. And it's, it, whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's a force. Yeah, it's very much like the whole world is knocking at the door and inside the room there's just nine people, these nine countries, these nine nuclear weapons countries. And all the other ones say, hey, we count. You know, we're on the same planet. And, but the ability of these nuclear powers to stay deaf to that is mind-blowing to me. Uh, so it will be interesting to see uh, the rest of this administration the next 10, 20 years. What, we d what do we do about it? Yeah. So we're just about out of time. I have one last question, and it's a really simple one to answer. It's actually two, two in one. Was the Reykjavik summit a success or a failure, and is this dream still impossible? Okay. <laughs> I see it as a, as a failure. Gorbachev sees it as a breakthrough. Of course, there's two ways to see it. Uh, they failed to reach that deal, uh, but it also led the way to the first START treaty and uh, to, uh, to uh, the INF, uh, the International Range uh, Agreement. So it's a victory in that way, and it did create a, a dynamic to talk uh, and to have some results, for sure. But what a missed opportunity. You know, as they, as they say during, during these two days, it, it could never happen before, and it might never happen again. And that's exactly what happened. 30 years later, we can say that was the only window uh, where it could happen. Uh, because who knows, who would know who would come after Gorbachev within the Soviet Union system? Maybe a hawk, you know. Uh, Reagan was old and you don't know who comes next in a democracy. So it's, um, it's a missed opportunity for me. I think a lot of the diplomatic corps felt it that way. I mean, definitely George Schultz felt that way. He kind of denies it. But uh, when you see his, uh, when you look at the memorandum of, of conversations, most of the time he takes sides with the Soviets and he tries to convince Reagan, Reagan to strike the deal. Like he has this way to, hold on, let me summarize what you just said, Mr. General Secretary. Are you saying that you want to get rid of nuclear weapons within 10 years, really? And then it, it, you know, go, it, it feeds the conversation. So definitely he wanted a deal. And his reaction after the collapse of the talk, he gives that press conference in Reykjavik one or two hours later. It's live on American television at night, mm -hmm. and he has tears in his eyes. He's exhausted. He can't find his words. And the journalists are like, are you, who don't know what happened, are saying, are you saying that you were almost, you know, getting rid of nuclear weapons? And why didn't you do it? You know, uh, in the same way, there's this uh, amazing, I don't want to be too long, but this amazing uh, conversation in the back of Air Force One on the way back to Washington between Point Dexter and the journalists there. You have the New York Times, the CBS News, everybody's there. And he's telling what happened. And the journalists can't believe their eyes that they didn't accept the deal. Yeah. So, again, because who knows what's going to come next. You had that opportunity and you failed. So that's, that's how I feel, mostly.
So I don't want to be too pessimistic, but definitely today's world is way more complicated. There's more countries with nuclear weapons. Uh, even our democracies seems in crisis. Our Western leaders don't seem to want or maybe don't know how to deal with it. Um, but, you know, maybe a younger generation will rise to power and will want to, to resume the talks. Uh, we'll see. Before we open things up for questions from the floor, I just want to thank and ask you to join me in thanking Guillaume for this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.